The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 12 this morning. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray for ears to hear, ears that hear your words and not mine. For eyes to see, eyes that see the way you have before us, for hearts that are open, open, Lord, to give, but also to receive what it is you have for us. So be with us now, God. Speak to us that we may hear. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today is the 11th day of Christmas. Did anybody get their uh, pipers piping? I think it is. <laughs> Lords are leaping. The ladies dancing one takes on a little kind of different connotation these days, I guess. Um, the 11th day of Christmas tomorrow is the 12th day Epiphany, which is the day we usually in the Christian calendar uh, recognize the arrival of the Magi and the end of Christmas. I wonder, uh, though, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? When I was a kid, that was a, a different question. Did you get every, well, not everything I wanted. I mean, as a kid, Christmas is a lot different. I don't know when it happens. Uh, when you become an adult, I think, is when you stop looking forward to getting things and start dreading having to give so much. But when I was a kid, Christmas was, well, we had, I wouldn't call them traditions. They were a bit different in my family. My parents were divorced from a very young age, and so uh, we alternated Christmases. Some Christmas Eves, I stayed with Dad and, and my stepmom and, and all of the gaggle of people that lived at, at what we call the compound. Um, and on Christmas Eve at Dad's, there was one tradition that was always to open one present. Now, as a kid, that sounds exciting, and somehow you forget every year that that one present is pajamas. Always the same kind of pajamas, except for one year when my stepmom handed me the package and I said, wait, this one's a little, a little lighter. And I opened it and it was Fred Flintstone boxer shorts <laughs> that I'm pretty sure she meant to buy for my much younger cousin. You can figure out the difficulties that come with that later. We stayed at mom's house. We got to open one on Christmas Eve, too. You got to go over to the tree, and almost like a metal detector, you'd hover your hands. Can I get this one? No. Can I get this one? But you never knew. You'd pull it out. Oh, maybe, maybe this is a Game Boy. Oh, Kool-Aid socks. You know what Kool-Aid socks are? 
tube socks with the colored stripe at the top is what we call them, those Kool-Aid socks. But that was okay. If you didn't get what you wanted on Christmas Eve, guess what? There was Christmas morning. And at Dad's house, it looked like a castle of presents. And as a kid, that was amazing to me. As an adult, maybe like last year, I realized why. There was a, there were just too many of us. And so even if each of us only got one thing, it's still a bunch of presents. But you'd get one and you'd open it. I'd, I'd always open it slowly, almost prayed, Lord, let this be a Game Boy, even though the package is way too big. Let this be a Game Boy. No, it's a basketball. Thanks. Uh, let this one be a Game Boy. No, it's too small. Maybe God will miraculously like loaves and fishes when you open the box. Pff, out pops again. No. But that was okay. If you didn't get what you wanted at Dad's house, if you woke up there, we went to Mom's house. And at Mama's, well, maybe I'll get it here. Maybe and you open the present, please, Lord, let this be. No, no. Well, at the end, all the paper and boxes laying around, guess what? It's still okay because we're going to get in the car and we're going to go to Ma's house. Ma was my maternal grandmother. So we all get in the car, and that was the best place because my aunts and uncles, when I was a kid, I thought they had money. And so we go to Ma's house, and one year my Uncle Jerry got me a bicycle. That was amazing. One year Ma got me the complete six-disc box set of Garth Brooks CDs. Oh, man. It was something else. I didn't even have a CD player at the time. That was something else. <laughs> but even at malls, if you didn't get everything you wanted, there was still this thing, this like hair hanging in the back of my throat when I was little. I think, well, maybe, maybe we'll go to Aunt Gail's this year. Aunt Gail was my dad's oldest sister, and if we were going over there, of course they were obligated to give us gifts. And so we'd show up, oh, thanks, a dollar store He-Man. Uh, that was really what I wanted at 15. Um, there's always hope that maybe somebody at some point would give you what you wanted. But I remember one year, I think I was 10 or 11, I'd opened all the gifts, the Christmas tree and everything was still up. When James and Joe pulled up to the curb in their big old blue Oldsmobile as they had done most Wednesday nights for several years of my life. James and Joe Preachers were the people who lived just a few blocks from me. Aptly enough, his last name was Preacher because I think he's is James still alive? Kathy, do you know James Preachers? Okay, I know. I think we lost Joe, I think, a few years ago. But James and Joe would pull up to the curb, and I'd climb in the back of that car, and they'd drive me 10 or 15 miles out to Goodman Baptist Church, where I'd play football with the other boys. We'd have RAs, which meant we'd play football, and Brother Jerry Jones would tell us a story from the Bible. <laughs> and then when the adults got done with church, we'd pile back in the cars and go home. I do think we said the pledge to the American Christian flag in the Bible, even though no one had any of those things out in the parking lot. But I remember one year as we pulled that boat of a car up to the curb on Hill Street. Christmas was over. I was kind of down thinking, oh, I didn't get what I wanted. That's okay, I guess. There's always next year. When James said, oh, before you get out of the car, he reached under that little fold-down cushion, and there was a package, and he handed it to me and said, Merry Christmas. I know it's kind of late. And I said, thank you. Thank you. I ran out of the door, ran into the house. Mama, Mr. Preachers gave me a present. Can I open it? Is it okay if I open it? Yeah, go ahead. And man, you can imagine. I don't even remember what I wanted. I just remember opening that, and I opened it, and it was a ceramic Christmas tree ornament. John 3.16 written on it. That's what you want when you're 10, right? After Christmas, a Christmas tree ornament. John 3.16, for God so loved the... I guess you put on the tree, Mama. What's funny is last year when I was at home at Mama's house, she had her tree up, little pieces of construction paper, a picture of my sister from the second grade in the middle of it, Merry Christmas, whatever, 1990-something. There was a milk bone that I had made in elementary school and put green pipe cleaners and a red pom-pom on to make Rudolph. One of the eyes had fallen off, hanging on the tree different little painted balls and pieces of paper. And among all those ornaments, stuck right there where you could see it, a ceramic ornament with John 3.16 painted on it. A little darker now from being in a house full of smoke for a few years, but it's still there. I don't remember a single thing that I got that Christmas except for that little ornament. I still don't particularly like it. That's when I said Mama's house and not mine. But, you know, I probably would have forgotten about James and Joe by now if it hadn't been for that ornament on Mama's tree. 
It's funny how the things we get at Christmas are sometimes unexpected. I think they, they really should be. To get what you want, that's too easy. Go buy it yourself. But the unexpected stuff. Isn't it weird how the stories we hear even around Christmas, they just become rote to the point where, yeah, yeah, baby Jesus, Mary, Joseph, angels, wise men at the manger, hold on. They're not there. If you come in my office, I have a few nativity scenes set out. Uh, before this week, the wise men are always far away or kept in the drawer because they're not there. They're not there yet. The Magi come. We're so familiar with this story. We three kings of... Oh, that's a, you may like that song. I'm not real fond of it, but we can talk about that later. These Magi, these astrologers of Zoroastrianism, an ancient Middle Eastern religion that even Islam finds some of its roots in. Here they come. They've seen this strange thing in the sky. Now, now people don't really know what it is. Maybe it was Saturn and Jupiter had, had crossed... Their orbits in the, the constellation Pisces, that's what some think. Some think, well, maybe the, the, this all happened a little bit earlier than we suspect. Halley's Comet would have flown through the sky around the year 12 B.C., so maybe, maybe it's a little earlier than we thought. Some think it was maybe a supernova that we didn't have the, the way of tracking or recording so long ago. Even now, maybe this may not be of interest to any of you, but there's a star named Betelgeuse. It's in the armpit of the constellation Orion. It's lost 50% of its brightness in the last six months, and it's going to turn into a supernova soon. Don't wait for it. It'll be in like 100,000 years. Um, but when it happens, when it happens, it will be brighter than the moon for weeks, maybe months. So maybe... Maybe it was that. I don't know, and honestly, I don't care. All I know is Matthew says they followed a star, and probably for about two years, is the way we reckon it when they tell Herod when they first saw it. But isn't that weird? Why did they go to Herod? Why would these, these magi who've seen something, they've deciphered that it's, it's about the birth of a king, why on earth go to Herod? A king. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? If I said go to the doctor, you're going to go to the hospital, a med care place. You're not going to the closet next to the bathroom at Star Mart. You're going to where the kings are. And so the Magi show up and say, All right, we've seen a star. Where's the new king? And Herod is frightened. Because last time Herod checked, he didn't have a baby. And Matthew says, all of Jerusalem with him. Now, isn't that odd? What's got everybody so scared all of a sudden? Strangers, foreigners from out of town come and say, we've come to see the new king. They didn't get the word. You mean to tell me the capital city of the nation of God didn't get the word that the king of the Jews was going to be born? But these magi did. And they tell them all about how they saw the star, all about where it came from. Herod is scared, and so what does Herod do like Pharaoh in the book of Exodus? Well, you just tell us when you saw it, and then when you find it, let me know. We all know he doesn't want to pay homage to the child. He kills all the children born two years or younger. He's scared. But then there are these magi. It casually says that they just went out, they saw the star when it stopped where, they, uh, where it was, over the place where the child was. They were overwhelmed with joy. I find that a bit odd. It would be like if, if, I don't know, a star stopped over my house and you came by, would you be overwhelmed with joy? We don't, we, I don't even know if we have a wreath on the door anymore. I mean, Mary and Joseph don't live in a, in a mansion, in a castle. Is this the place? Monty Python spoofs this a bit in the movie Life of Brian. They show up at another house where another child named Brian had been born. And after realizing their mistake, they take back their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh and take it down the road to where this other kid named Jesus had been born. Why are they filled with joy? There's nothing extraordinary here 
They go into the house, they see Mary. Isn't it odd Matthew doesn't say Joseph? They see Mary, the child with her, and they knelt down and paid him homage. It is to me the most unexpected thing that these magi came upon. The birth of a king, not in the palace. The birth of a king, not in the great state halls of Jerusalem. The birth of a king, not not at the temple, but at some little hamlet on some little back road where a mother is sitting there with her child in her lap. And still, they paid him homage. They did that first. I didn't really think much about that for a long time, but that's the first thing they did. Then, Matthew says, they opened their treasures, offering him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Why, why would you do it that way? Now, Sally is not in it, but she'll tell you, I, if I buy a gift, I can't hold I want to give it to you. Like, if, if Amazon gets it there a day early, you're getting it a day early. Like, because I just, there's something about it. Like, oh man, I just need you. I got, it's burning a hole in my pocket, in my backpack. It's going to catch my desk on fire. I just got to get it out and give it to you. Why? Yeah, I'm a little excited about it, but here's the other thing. Here's the truth about it. Maybe, maybe this isn't true for you. I hope it's not. If I have a gift and I give you one first, I hope you're going to give me one too. French philosopher Jacques Derrida talks about this. He says, this is the problem with gifts. There's always an obligation, so a true gift is never one you give. It's true. You can imagine the Magi busting in the house. Oh, look at this, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So now, king of the Jews, what are you going to do for us? But Matthew doesn't say it that way. The first thing they do is pay him homage. It's an odd phrase. They worshipped him. Gave themselves to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that's nice. But they came first to give his worship. Now, I don't know. I don't know what you give to each other at Christmas. I don't know what you set aside for God in your heart, in your wallet, in your home. But I know it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we used to say when diddly squat. (laughs) It doesn't matter at all if the first thing you give to God isn't you. It doesn't matter at all. All the great things you can do and accomplish in this world. It doesn't matter if they call you magi, wise men, or kings. It doesn't matter if the first thing you do isn't to pay him homage. To worship. To give yourself fully to God. That's it. I think it's, it's appropriate that the first real day on the Christian calendar in our normal calendar is Epiphany. For the wise men to show up, to remind us that the birth of Christ isn't over, to remind us that the very first and most important thing we do is give ourselves to Him. Even if He comes up in unexpected ways, not born as a child on silk bed sheets in the mansion or the palace, but some poor, unknown baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in his mother's lap in some hamlet on some back alley. The first thing we do, the first thing we do in 2020, the first thing we do with our breath in the morning, the first thing we do with all of our lives ought to be to pay him homage, to worship the Christ child, the Christ crucified, the Christ raised, the Christ eternal. The first thing we do is pay him homage. May it be the first thing we do together and individually, today, every day, and every year hereafter. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, 
Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit. To you, Lord, we owe all of who we are. So God, help us to give more of who we are to you every day. Help us to see, Lord, that nothing else in this world matters, not titles, not not wealth, not our accomplishments, nothing. Nothing matters as much as our worship and love and devotion to you. So help us, God. Help us when we seek to place other things at the head. Help us, Lord, when we seek to put things before you. Help us most of all, God, when we seek to put ourselves ahead of anything else, especially you. So Holy Spirit, be with us now. Move in our midst, speak to us. Lord, whatever it is you are calling us to do, give us the courage today to respond. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.